to a Saturday night on KABC. We call it Open Mind. My name is Bill Jenkins, and we're here to introduce your mind to some new things that may stretch it and expand it and cause you to reach for new horizons and thoughts. And tonight, frankly, is a difficult show in its own way. Because some of the things we deal with tonight are not the things that perhaps we want to hear about the world that we live in. Our subject is Royal Rife. He is a local citizen of our community, in fact. Did some very monumental things, in fact. It could be said that he perhaps found the cure for cancer and leukemia and catastrophic diseases. For he was a man well ahead of his time, certainly a man who had an open mind. And that great work that happened decades ago, was somehow or another thrown away. Reason? Well, I think the facts are pretty clear that the reason was greed. And we'll get into that with you tonight. Our guests to talk about that are some people who know, who have studied very closely the life of Royal Rife, who was the inventor of the Rife microscope, and in that microscope, which was one of the most incredible optic devices that has ever been developed, probably stands that way today. I have Steve and Laverne Ross with me of the World Research Foundation. And did I get it right about Royal Rife? Yes, I would say that you phrased it very accurately. The, uh, the saga of this uh, researcher, uh, scientist, we can't call him Dr. Rife, can we? No. Although he certainly knew as much about medicine as any doctor who has any sheepskin on his wall, right? Is uh, one of great triumph and joy and an all at once shattering defeat. Why is that? Well, I think it was a matter of the time period. Uh, as he said, really, the last words before he died, the mistake he made was looking through the microscope. He never felt it was a mistake building the microscope. But once he visualized the microorganisms in the particular state that the microscope would, would allow to be viewed, he came in direct combat with the prevalent theories of the day in regards to medicine. And I think that was the big problem. Hmm. In other words, the researcher, the innovator, the one who finds something new, has a great deal of trouble with the establishment if it disagrees with what the establishment thinks is. Definitely, it, it is not something that's new. He had a tremendous amount of credentialed individuals behind him. However, he was bucking an establishment at the time that tended to favor pharmaceuticals and chemicals, whereas his particular discoveries tended to show that oscillations and frequencies might be something more conducive to the body. Well, just to whet your appetite a little bit then, if you just joined us. Dr. Reif looked at the little microorganisms that were giving us things like cancer and leukemia and tuberculosis and all of that, and he was able to shatter them, destroy them, with a oscillation of electromagnetic energy. Now, his peers did not like that because he was not using chemicals or cutting. Is that what it boils down to? I would say very much. In fact, uh, to help clarify, there were really two aspects that were taking place. Dr. Reif had invented a microscope that was, at that time and even today, ten times more powerful than any light source microscope. Now, along with that, he also developed a frequency device which he used to generate the frequencies to devitalize various organisms. We have found most of the times when people hear the story, they tend to combine or mix up the two, but there was actually two different processes that took place. Uh, Dr. Reif, Royal Reif, had an advantage of an employer, Timken, Mr. Timken of San Diego, Timken Ball Bearings, that had quite a bit of wealth, and put in an enormous amount of money to build the laboratory. 
Reif proceeded to build the most sophisticated microscope that we feel even today has ever been developed of a light source quality. Now, he spent many years viewing and peering through this microscope, and it was these various discoveries of the electromagnetic constituency, really, the frequencies of various organisms, that if that was all he had done would be quite remarkable. But he went one step even further than that, and he found a way to devitalize the microorganisms, the viruses of cancer, uh, tuberculosis, strep, leprosy, very, very remarkable. Quite a long list, I think 40, 52 different uh, microorganisms. That That's he, correct. That he had learned how to devitalize, as you say, in other words, kill, right. including in that cancer as one. I have looked at the movies. I have looked at the movies that were taken through the microscope. I have looked at the movies that showed him developing cancer in the rats, for instance. Horrendous cancer. Taking the cancer cells then and implanting them. And then we look at the cancer cells through the microscope. And we see then the cancer cells destroyed with, what is that, an Abrams generator? <clears throat> right. And they are destroyed right before your eyes. I have looked at the data and the history that he went on then and used this on human patients, and he did a, a terrible thing. They were cured. <laughs> Time frame? 1934. In the early 30s. Right. Why do we have cancer today? Why is this technique not being used today? That's what we're all about here tonight. Because there is something not working well in our society. And that's the reason it's a difficult show. You would think that if someone could relieve the kind of suffering, the cancer, leukemia, and tuberculosis, and, well, 52 different catastrophic diseases have contributed to the existence of man since 1934, that he would be regarded as a great hero and be revered among all of us, and certainly among those in the medical profession. But that's not the way that story turned out. And it's not because he couldn't do or didn't do what he did. It is because he could do exactly what he said he could do. And how very sad. Do you want to stay aboard? I'm Bill Jenkins. With me, Steve and Laverne Ross of the World Research Foundation on Open Mind on Talk Radio 79 KABC. I-F-E. He is a citizen or lived here in Los Angeles. His laboratory was in Chatsworth, I believe. Uh, San Diego. Or in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And uh, was very much a part of the scene in the late 20s and the early 30s. And a very, uh, almost like Tesla for a while. He was the, uh, the champion of the cause. Absolutely. Because he was doing great things. But the, the secret to what he found out, and let's start the story from the very beginning, are the amazing microscopes that he developed. This is a 50,000 power optical microscope which puts it on par with the electron microscopes of today, does it not? Well, it, uh, the electron microscopes recently have gone up to over a million magnification. However, the drawback is that many times because of the process, they're looking at dead cells. In fact, if you can imagine today's science, many of the organisms they look at are already dead, and we've always jokingly said that's like picking up a dead dog in the street and trying to figure out what the personality is. Mm -hmm. And this is what a lot of today's research is. When you put these specimens in the slide into a vacuum and bombard it with electrons, you, you destroy it. You are not looking at the same organism. Reif was able to build a device that even today, the theoretical limitations of a light source microscope with clarity is supposed to be 2,500. And he had a 50,000 power microscope. And by the way, that microscope is still here. <laughs> yeah, so it's, it had been lost for about 50 years. But it is uh, ensconced and very capably so in the hands of the World Research Foundation. Right yes, we, we might add, though, it's not on our premises. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's in a safe place. It's... Uh, it's a remarkable story, as you mentioned, of really the heights of scientific achievement and in regards to Rife, really the, the depths for an individual. Well, let me just shut up for a little bit and let you tell us the story of the development of, not, of the five microscopes and what happened to them. 
if you want to. You have the floor. Just jump right in there. Jump in there and go. Uh, as I had mentioned, Rife had the support of two really influential individuals with a lot of money, Timken and a man named Bridges of Bridges Carriage Company. They provided Royal Rife with all of the money and all of the scientific equipment that he wanted. He proceeded to feel that the microscopes of the day really weren't utilizing principles that would be beneficial for scientific research. And he, in his own laboratory, built a sequence of five microscopes. The first microscope achieved 17,000 magnification. The universal, which was number three, achieved 50,000. And the other three uh, were developed for various functions. Now, the remarkable thing about this achievement is that not only was he able to achieve very high magnification with clarity, but a very, very remarkable thing happened when he peered through the microscope. He was able to stain the various organisms using frequencies. In other words, as he peered through the microscope, utilizing the principles of the scope, the various viruses would illuminate in their own natural color. Now, so we don't lose a lot of your viewers, we're not going to go into the highly physics or the technical aspect, and we'll try to keep it simplistic, but the idea is that, as an example... i got a bright yes. bunch out there. Okay. Yeah, they can stay with <laughs> you. Okay. Right uh, the virus of cancer was always a purplish red. The virus of typhoid was always a turquoise blue. And 60 various diseases, the viruses that really were prevalent in that diseases, would illuminate in a color. Now, why this is very, very intriguing is once you know the color, you can determine the frequency. That is what color is. And he then was able to discover, as you mentioned earlier, the mortal oscillatory rate or death frequency of those viruses based on the colors that they would give off. Now, the principle he used was basically heterodyning light. Mm -hmm. And then he would take an, uh, a substance that would normally not have illuminated a color, and it would illuminate. Now, he also had a very strong technical group behind him, including Dr. Lee DeForest, who is regarded as the father of modern radio tubes, yes. who built a frequency generator. And it was said of, of Royal Rife that... He would spend anywhere from 36 to 48 hours almost straight peering through his microscope at the slide with the color, turning a frequency dial very, very slowly. And when he hit the correct frequency, the color would immediately dis uh, extinguish from the slide or, or really through his viewing microscope. Because he was looking at a living organism. Absolutely. Instead of the often dead organisms you would look at through the electron microscope. Mm -hmm. But really in the simplistic way, once that color, or as soon as that color was extinguished, that was the mortal oscillatory frequency of that microorganism. There was a different frequency, not only for each different virus, but he, and you asked me earlier what the problem was, he unfortunately ended up at a time when there was a tremendous battle going on between the camps of Pasteur and Camp, which had continued for many years. That is the feeling that microorganisms within the body mutate. It is not just one organism all the time. That even the cancer virus mutates during different stages of its development. And this is what he verified 100% through his microscope. So a frequency for cancer would only work at that cancer at a particular state, but he discovered the frequencies at other stages even of the cancer. Mm -hmm. So you really, as I mentioned, have two incredible processes going on. One was the, the building of an incredible microscope, but number two, the frequency devices, which were also later to, to really, we feel, be the crux of his problem. You might say, well, what is the big threat of a microscope? Really, there is no threat of a microscope. The threat was a technique that eliminated diseases by frequency rather than by chemical. And who was that threatening to? 
Certainly not the people. No. Not the patients. No. Not the ones with cancer. No, you would have to look at, again, the pharmaceutical industry of the day. However, even in our records, we do not have directly uh, direct evidence that this particular person was responsible. However, you would have to say, as an example, there are over a hundred newspaper articles talking about the microscope in the 30s and 40s. There were articles in the Smithsonian Institute of the U.S. government. There were articles in the Franklin Institute, Scientific America. Today, if you go through the computer, you find no references that Royal Rife ever existed. You find no references that the microscope ever existed. And just in our local area, with the advantage of UCLA's library and University of Northridge, with over 350 books on microscopes, there is not one sentence, not one word of Royal Raymond Rife or the Universal Microscope. Now, one thing we have not really stated so far in the show is who was, who was utilizing the microscope. We had E.C. Rosenau of the Mayo Clinic, who even today is considered one of the greatest researchers in the history of the Mayo. We had Arthur Kendall of Northwestern University. We had Milbank Johnson, locally of the uh, AMA, which is very interesting. He was one of Wright's biggest supporters. We had Carl Meyer, who was regarded as one of the best biologists in the United States. All of these individuals used the microscope and the poliomyelitis virus was seen at the Mayo Clinic by Rosenau. Now with all of that as a background, it becomes even more remarkable that not one line appears in any book about the microscope. And those men all wrote papers. Absolutely. And they wrote books. Right. They were great researchers. Right. They utilized this incredible instrument. They saw the poliomeningitis uh, virus mm -hmm. with it probably with the universal microscope, which is the only one left. And thank goodness it's in your hands. And not a word. Did they know of the electronic way of getting rid of the viruses? All of the doctors were quite aware, in fact, at first, these researchers were very interested in discovering the, the cause and nature of diseases. After they were able to demonstrate that a lot of these were viruses, in fact, to, to really keynote exactly what you're saying, uh, Rife not only saw the virus of cancer, he, he had photographed it in 1934, and it wasn't until a few years ago that they finally admitted there was even a virus for cancer. All these individuals did write at first. E.C. Rosenau in the internal staff meetings of the Mayo Clinic wrote that due to this microscope, they were able to see forms of, of tuberculosis and typhus that they had never been able to see before. So they were writing at the beginning. When the frequency device was started to be utilized, this is when there seemed to be a clampdown. In fact, there was a, an article that appeared in the San Diego Tribune, Disease Organisms Destroyed Claim of San Diego Scientist. It seems that once that particular article came out, that everyone else really quieted down. There was not too much talk. Uh, even E.C. Uh, e. Rosenau never spoke about the Rife microscope again until his deathbed. And basically the thing that he said at the end was that the Rife microscope was legitimate. Well, we know it's legitimate. Definitely. And uh, we know these things were done. We have photographic evidence of that. There's a great deal of documentation to support not only the legitimacy of the microscope, in fact, it's there. And uh, I guess a qualified researcher can get past you, too, and get a chance to, uh, to utilize it. That's right. Uh, we also have seen photographic documentary evidence that he was utilizing an electronic method of killing the viruses. But it's not being used. And the viruses continue, and people die. Horrible deaths. And that is sad. Let's explore that a little bit further. I'm Bill Jenkins. With me is Stephen and Laverne Ross of the World Research Foundation. We're talking about Royal Rife.
the Sherman, Sherman, Oaks, Sherman Oaks out there. Marvelous facility for researchers. Uh, what they're doing is we, we'll get into what the World Research Foundation does. We've we've had um, had them on before, and their work is uh, delightfully important. And certainly, they are the keeper of that Rife microscope right now. Uh, but let's continue the story. Uh, did Royal Rife then start utilizing the uh, the science that he uncovered and start literally actually curing the diseases? Yeah, after he did his experimentations, and that was using the microscope with the slides, beaming the frequency device on or directed at the slides, it was eventually felt that it should be proceeded to the next step, which would be humans. So a special medical committee was formed in 1934 with Milbank Johnson as the chairman. Now, as I mentioned, interestingly enough, Milbank Johnson was the local head of the AMA in Pasadena. On that committee were several individuals, including Rufus von Kleinsmith of USC, who was then the president of USC, uh, Waylon Morrison of the Santa Fe Railway, Charles Fisher of Children's Hospital. We had E.C. Rosenau of the Mayo, Arthur Kendall of Northwestern. Now, they went to Pasadena County Hospital and took 16 incurable patients out to the Mary Ellen Scripps Ranch in La Jolla, California, with the idea that now that they had discovered the mortal oscillatory frequency, they would then use it on this group. Now, the pathologist of their research group was Dr. Alvin Ford, who was president of the American Association of Pathologists. He examined, and the committee examined, these individuals before the test and after the testing. And the results were that 14 of the 16 individuals were cured within 90 days, and the other two were cured one week after the special committee had closed. The special committee was sanctioned out of the University of Southern California. These were all considered terminal, terminal. patients. Yes. Mm -hmm. And there was a 100% cure rate. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that was under some of the most prestigious names in medicine that we could come up with in Southern California at the time. Uh, the diseases were what? They were terminal. That's, you know, bad enough. But... Uh, well, cancer, cancers, the, uh, they had various things. things. Absolutely. They, they were specifically chosen as the cases that were incurable at the time by orthodox methods. Uh -huh. And I don't want to imply that, that they were just wildly experimenting because this group of individuals had incredible credentials. They were very uh, humane and they took great care. This wasn't just uh, a last-ditch effort because they felt very secure that this would work. Now, now we sp must point out, too, Stephen, that uh, the information that we're giving you here is not, you know, we're not telling a little story here. Right. This is highly documented information that is a part of the record. Right. And anybody can have it anytime they want it. Right. We want to keep laying this foundation on you because it's not just a little story out of the air. Well, I think that what might help is that uh, we have 500 personal letters of the various doctors written back and forth to one another. We have the logs, their research logs. We have the newspaper clippings that existed at the time. We have the internal staff meetings of the Mayo Clinic, Northwestern University, so to answer your question or your statement, it's it's more than just idle gossip. Or it is very documented, as well, do much more documented than the Iran scandal is. <laughs> okay. So let's continue with the story. Why is it that we're sick now? Why hasn't this technique been used? What happened to it? Well, I think just to interject a little bit, that uh, right after that happened, there was an announcement in the newspapers. At that time, a lot of um, activities happened that people quieted down for a while. And um, I think what happened with Rive is he pulled in a little bit in, in what he was doing because it, at that time it was hard for a lot of people who were thinking in one way to accept his new technique. And uh, The people you're talking about are those in the established medical profession? Those probably except with those that were initially working in that committee. Yeah. 
who are overseeing the committee. They saw a 100% cure rate uh, using their own AMA standards of some of the most qualified men in the world. Right. And no chemical has ever done that. Ever. And that frightened them? I think that was very surprising to them. I think even today, for most of us, that would be quite um, a Herculean feat to do. We're still not capable of, of handling that in today's Did they science. duplicate it? Did they try to say, well, this was a fluke, that we made a mistake, that all of these terminal patients were actually going to get well anyway, <laughs> and uh, try it again, and uh, just figure that, you know, we picked a bunch of ones with strong genes. The, uh, the basic problem resides in the fact that in the United States, the feeling is that the body is chemical first and electrical second, which any physicist and even most doctors know that, if anything, it's the electrical first and the chemical second. There's been enough studies that have shown that there's an electrical reaction moments before or instances before the chemical. So the problem is, even today, as you're aware of the Congress we held, and we brought Bjorn Nordenstrom over from Sweden, who is shrinking cancer tumors with electricity, yet he's fighting even today, 50 years later. The problem is, is there is a very strong element and it's not just in the United States, it's in the whole world, that has been so conditioned for this quick answer with the chemical, with something that's just a pacifier, that they've completely forgotten about the laws of physics. So this is the problem then, this is the problem today. You have doctors who are trained in a technique, and I think this is the sad thing about science, and you really mentioned that, Bill, when you first came on. People get locked into one way, and anything new... I'll always remember the case, and I, uh, it slips my mind the doctor who had the audacity to say you should wash your hands be, uh, between patients and was laughed out of medicine and uh, I believe committed suicide and killed himself. Then later they discover, yes, that there are germs, there are bacteria, but anything that's new has to fight and struggle. But now we had another problem. We had a great financial base of individuals. We had a blossoming industry of chemicals that was extremely powerful at the day. But again, I'm not going to say that they directly came over and physically did something to write. However, there are a lot of records that disappeared. There were a lot of doctors who did not ever want to talk about Rife again. In fact, as you know, I brought a picture into your studio here, an original picture from mm -hmm. the 30s. On the back of it is a listing of about 25 doctors well, five years after this picture was taken, three-quarters of them claimed they didn't even know who Dr. Rife was. And there we have a photograph of them with a, at an elegant dinner. Well, it was actually a celebration. It was an article that was written in the paper celebrating the end of disease with the most prestigious medical doctors in the United States all present. So, the sadness of the story is that we had this man, Royal Rife, who invented and developed and fashioned together these incredible microscopes, which allowed us to see into a world we had never seen before, allowed us to see an enemy we had never seen before. And working with people like DeForest, who gave us the vacuum tube and actually the front work on television and the radio industry that we have and others, he was able to kill the enemy electronically that's data that's photographed you can look at that happen and I suppose there's a way that we can let you see that I've seen it uh, but this electronic generation of uh, a way to kill these viruses that were only giving us cancer and leukemia and tuberculosis and a whole raft of things did not fall in within the mindset of the medical community and certainly did not bode well with the pharmaceutical industry and all of the great billions of dollars it was making and the powers that it had over the society is the way it shapes up. The data is there. Is that what we're saying? 
Or are you just going to let me say that? <laughs> That's what you were saying. But That's no, what I was we, saying. We would, uh, we'll reiterate that... I'm a well-known iconoclast. Right. We, uh, the facts would tend to point out that, uh, obviously, the people in the electronic area would, would not want this to disappear. The pharmaceutical industry, and again, you cannot condemn the entire pharmaceutical industry, but let's just say the chemical, the people involved in the chemical aspect, uh, this would not be something that would be conducive to the industry that they were building and have built ever since. Uh, it would seem logical that uh, they would not like something like this available. Now, so what do they yeah. do? They exercise great influence, uh, ridicule, and put down. Go to the courts, in fact. In fact, they did. Did they not? Rife was taken to uh, court for, again, for the frequency devices. In fact, that, that was the element that even today has been the stumbling point the frequency devices. Now the